Okay, so I think we're recording, yeah. So Dr. Shapira has given me the opportunity to go back to one of my favorite authors and to help with um, instruction in this class. And that author is Mary Astell. And I'm gonna hold up my, my book, which I wrote. I didn't really write it, I edited mm -hmm. it with a graduate student and that was published in 2007. Mary Astle, Reason, Gender, and Faith, because the book um, considers the relationship between all of these things in Astle's work. And one of the reasons she's so interesting and the reason I decided to write a book about her or to edit a book about her is because those three variables, reason, um, and Estelle is a figure of enlightenment, which I'm sure you've heard about from Dr. Shapiro and Dr. Feldman as well. Estelle is a figure of enlightenment, she is also, we'll skip to the third term, a, a woman of, of, of passionate um, theological commitment and faith. In fact, she was in many ways seen as a religious conservative. She was um, at the time when the world was modernizing in many ways and the church in England was becoming more open and more tolerant, Estelle was insisting on a very, very um, circumscribed, a very um, uh, limited conception of the English church, and also was arguing against any other groups outside of the English church, meaning she was arguing for really going back to a church uh, that we're familiar with from, from reading Renaissance literature, churches run by by Elizabeth or, or even Charles. And Charles I, in some ways, remember him, he was killed in 1649 by the revolutionaries, including Milton. Um, Charles, Charles I is a kind of hero for her. And she, she is what's called a, a Jacobite, which means she wants to go back to the Jacobean family of Charles and James and to return Stuart monarchy in all its, its grandeur and to, to um, maintain a, a conception of one English church. So we skipped from reason to faith. So it's odd, on the one hand, Estelle gets associated, and rightly so, with a very conservative version of politics and religion, but the second term in the title, faith, uh, uh, gender, um, shows the extent to which Estelle was really a radical in thinking about um, women's liberty, women's freedom, women's education. One of the things maybe we'll talk about in class together is how these things go together, meaning the radical sense of gender and the more conservative sense of religion. Those are usually thought of going against one another. Really the book that we edited was a way of trying to explain that because most people have looked at Estelle and said, well, you know, she had very radical views about gender, but you know, she didn't go so far with her political and theological ideas. And that's basically a way, that's called anachronism. That's a way of reading the present into the past. We say it can't be possible since we see these things as coinciding, that is religious liberty and gender liberty and, and, and feminism. It must be so that it, that must be, that is the ideal and, anything that is short of that ideal is just a, a, um, a, uh, a not yet mature version of that ideal. It's on the same continuum. And the arguments of the book, a lot of people write about this, uh, show that her conservative theology actually informed her radical conceptions about gender. That should be interesting to many of us um, who maybe share those not necessarily ultra conservative ideas about theology, but who share, have a sense of, of commitments of faith and also commitments to equality. So from that point of view, uh, Estelle is extremely interesting. Um, we will be looking together um, in class at passages from two works. One we'll talk about a little bit now, A Serious Proposal to the Ladies. This was published in 1694 and then published several times afterwards. A serious Proposal to the Ladies was most, mostly, although still a, a brilliant writer, a beautiful and brilliant writer, is mostly a kind of educational program. That is um, bringing women into a realm of, of, of genuine and real education. For that, Estelle meant philosophy. As we'll see, and this will be important to our, our reading of the second text, to which I'll refer in a minute, um, 
what happens in the late 17th century, especially the well, uh, Estelle diagnoses it, is that women are consigned to the realm of fiction and men are understood as, as um, inhabiting that world of truth and science. We'll provide some background for that. So Estelle's, part of Estelle's argument is, is stop reading so many novels and, and learn philosophy or, or learn about um, science. There is a very well-known kind of pseudo-scientist named Margaret, a philosopher, certainly a philosopher named Margaret Cavendish, who was a great playwright, uh, uh, a philosopher who was in dialogue with most of the major philosophers of the period. Um, and she was uh, permitted to, to take a tour of the Royal Society. Um, and she, there are, there's, there are, I think, even representations of this trip that she made to the Royal Society in which she's very clearly decked out in all the accoutrements of the feminine and very much seen as this visitor, this foreigner into this completely male domain, which she inhabited very brilliantly. Um, so Estelle is not the only one who is articulating a, or participating in the languages of science and philosophy, but Estelle's a, a part of her mission really is, is to, um, is to change women's education, to change what they learned. I mean, she, of course, we should mention she's mo mostly writing for the upper class. It's also an interesting historical footnote that the revolutionaries tended to have, uh, the English Civil War, tended to have the most um, inflexible conceptions of, of gender and of the superiority in many realms of the masculine. And it's in, in, in Tory or conservative circles that one begins to see uh, the beginnings of what we might call uh, proto-feminism. And part of that has to do with uh, wealth. Class, it's a class where it's it's a class thing. Meaning, women of of uh, of an upper class of it can afford to be educated. Um, so, as I said, um, we'll look at a, just a few passages from some reflections, not some reflections from a series proposal. Um, let's see. Let's see what she talks about here. Well, Estelle here, um, she blames women for being content with the role that they're consigned by men. So she writes here, and I'll, 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 pass, off, I'll pass on the, um, the reading. So you can look at this um, in the text itself. How can you be content to be, to be in, in the world like tulips in a garden to make a fine show and be good for nothing? Um, so Estelle, one of the things that makes her such a, an interesting reader of her contemporary situation is she sees the codependence between male conceptions of, of con conquest in courtship of the feminine and, and also feminine agency and responsibility. How can you be content to be in the world like tulips in a garden to make a fine show and to be good for nothing? Why, she goes on and says, do you pursue butterflies and trifles, let us learn to pride ourselves in something more excellent than the invention of a fashion, the pitiful conquest of some worthless heart. Um, Estelle's, as I said, like the, she's just a great an analyst of, of the, the realm of contemporary courtship. Um, why are they so interested in, or why do they take so much pride in the pitiful conquest of some worthless heart? Um, Estelle points out that women may perform some kind of conquest of the masculine in courtship, but it's ultimately the man that leaves, is, 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 is victorious. Let's read this over here. Women are denied opportunities of improvement from without, has therefore by way of compensation endowed them with greater propensions to virtue and a natural goodness within, oh I see, which if duly managed would raise them to the most eminent pitch of heroic virtue. One more time. Women, though denied opportunities of improvement for, for, from without, are by compensation endowed with greater propensions to virtue because they are insulated from the outside world, interestingly, and they're spared a certain kind of education. I think it's probably a better kind of, the better word to say would be they're spared a certain kind of acculturation. They have a greater chance for a certain kind of, of her, heroic virtue. Um, 
hears more. Women by custom, by habit, are taught to be proud and petulant, delicate and fantastic, humorous and inconstant. It is not strange that the ill effects of this conduct appear in all of the, in all the actions of their life. And here, Estelle is really hammering the point home. Thus, ignorance and a narrow education lay the foundation of vice, and Im imitation and custom reared up custom that merciless torrent that carries all before tis custom therefore the tyrant custom which is the grand motive to all those irrational choices which we daily see made in the world so very contrary to our present interest and pleasure as well as to our future custom and, and Estelle is thinking not only of a future professional success or even marital success, she's talking about the future as in the soul of the Christian. Here's what I guess an analysis of codependence, those are obviously my words. She need not, here Estelle is talking about uh, a, a contemporary, not an ideal, a kind of false ideal of a contemporary woman. She need not make herself so cheap as to descend to court their applauses, for the greater distance she keeps and the more she's above them, the more effectually she secures their esteem and wonder. A great description of the politics of courtship. I, I bet it still exists, or I bet it still maintains even today. Be so generous then, ladies, as to do nothing unworthy of you, so true to your interests as not to lessen your empire and appreciate and depreciate your charms. I think the empire she's referring to here is not the empire um, associated with the census and, um, and, uh, and courtship, but a different kind of spiritual empire and charms. She uses a very interesting way. She's using it here, it's, it's doubling. Um, for her, charms is not just the charm uh, in a social context, but also having to do, I think, with grace, social, uh, a, a, a kind of divinely endowed charm. Okay, so that, that's a little bit of background into Estelle's um, educational program. Um, We'll be looking at um, Estelle's in class, some reflections on, on marriage. I'm not, let's, your screen chaining is paused. No, I'm not paused. Uh, can you still see this? No. Stop share. Now let's add share, screen share. Um, Okay, so here, there we go. Um, here, we'll get to some reflections on marriage. And some reflections on marriage is essentially an argument in which Estelle says it's better for a woman not to marry. Um, part of her educational program was this idea of feminine withdrawal. And that's also interesting from the point of view of, of Cavendish. Margaret Cavendish, I mentioned her earlier, she wrote some plays. One is called The Convent of Pleasure. And this idea that the feminine, in order to educate itself, needs to withdraw. Um, uh, Cavendish is obviously playing with this metaphor of a convent. It's not so much a convent, or it's weird. Uh, the idea of religious withdrawal and pleasure are going together in idiosyncratic ways. Um, Astel also calls for a certain kind of withdrawal, a withdrawal from the realm of the masculine. Um, and she was accused by many of, of like, of, of kind of, of, of a Catholic emphasis on withdrawal of a nunnery, which was very unpopular, of course, in Anglican England. Um, but nonetheless, Estelle seemed to be arguing that in order for women to truly educate themselves, they had to pull away from a masculine world, which was providing the feminine with their own sense of self-definition, which she found this is what, what to the detriment of women. Now, um, some reflections on marriage is, is Estelle's most interesting uh, sociological analysis of courtship. And one of the distinctions that she uses in that text is a distinction between truth and artifice. Now, as soon as I say that, students of the Renaissance, you should automatically think back to the emphasis on artifice in the, in the Renaissance and the way in which various authors, Sidney, Spencer, Shakespeare, are all trying to defend art and artifice. Now what happens in the 17th century as philosophy emerges as Hobbes uh, in, in, on the continent, Descartes, and then Locke, who some of you have read, um, 
enlightenment languages take priority, meaning if we have to think about, well, what is the privileged discourse? Remember going back to Plato and Aristotle, for Plato, poetry is at a third removed from the truth, at a third, and, and, and like the disciplinary, on the bottom of the disciplinary totem pole, um, the Renaissance in Shakespeare and Donne and Spencer is an attempt through, through, spent, through Sydney and going back to Aristotle to, to, to once again allow poetry to make certain kinds of truth claims. Of course, it's not articulated in the language of philosophy, it's not articulated in the language of poetry, but that's clearly what's happening. Once, this, once we start to hit philosophy in the middle of the 17th century, um, the criteria for truth is no poetry is kind of pushed is being pushed slowly back. So when Estelle deploys this distinction between um, poetry and truth, she is doing it in an already pre-existent tradition. And I'm just going to review that a little bit here, a because it's fun for me, and b because it provide will provide a great context for a discussion of of Estelle. Let's see, we'll go through Bacon some Hobbes, maybe some Locke and Addison, and then we'll, and then we'll, I think we'll stop before us, so let's see. So here's an oldie but goodie. There is one principle and as it were radical distinction between different minds in respect to philosophy and sciences, which is this, that some minds are stronger and apter to mark the differences of things, others to mark their resemblance. The steady and acute mind can fix its contemplations and dwell on and fasten on the subtlest distinctions the lofty and discursive mind recognizes and puts together the finest and most general general resemblances, both kinds however easily err in excess by catching the one at gradations, the other at shadows. Two kinds of people in the world, people who make distinctions and people who see resemblances. As we said, um, in Bacon's world, he certainly places an emphasis on um, distinctions and in fact associates that, that world of resemblance with an older you could call it a poetic world, a religious world, the world of correspondences. Remember that image of the astronomer looking up at into the world, but first he's looking at his book, which comes first. The, the, the language about the world comes before the experience of the world itself. And the language about the world, as Bacon complains endlessly, is full of these resemblances, hierarchies, similarities, which are very elegant and beautiful and satisfying to the mind. Their only problem is they're just not true. Um, but Bacon does, mem he does emphasize both of these things he here, but you can already see here the seeds for the distinction between these two ways of thinking. One could say, I think for the poetry of Don, Don does both of these things, which is why he's great, such a great poet. He distinguishes and he brings together. And the reason he's such a successful poet is because even as he's bringing them together, the distinctions maintain. I think in a Shakespearean sonnet, he says two distincts, division, none. But, and, and that's in the middle of the canonization as well, right? Um, whatever, you can look it up. That central stanza in which we both get that singularity and doubleness, or is it in Valediction and Forbidding Morning, or it might actually be both of them. Um, so you, hear, you have here in, in Bacon's uh, formulation, the beginning of what will break up into two separate ways of viewing the world. One associated with fancy, that is similes, similarities, and metaphors, and one associated with judgment. Judgment being distinction, Hobbes lays it out in elements of law, and I think which he's fair, I think he's in this passage, he is, um, he will not reject fancy and similitudes as he will later, as we see right now, in Leviathan. Ready for this? This is just a, 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 a um, powerfully articulated and, and um, very influential set of conceptions here. I don't know, it might not be Hobbes only, but Hobbes certainly is, is, is distilling a growing enlightenment sensibility in which people are looking back at similarities and saying, what? Remember Dr. Johnson in relationship to, to Dunn? Remember what he says? I think it might even be here. Um, uh, the most heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together. That's Johnson looking at Dunn and saying, what, right? Meaning looking at those, the bringing together of distinctions and saying those things belong apart. That is from the sensibility of the distinction that Bacon is emphasizing in the Nova Morgana. First, break things into parts. We'll worry about similarities later. Um, so here in Hobbes, we find almost a full throttled rejection 
of, 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 uh, of similarity and therefore poetry. And there, therefore the demotion of poetry into being something that is understood as mere embellishment. Meaning it's not something that will tell us the truth about the world. It might make the world prettier and you know, that's like wallpaper. So you see poetry, that's why we have, we are still in the virtual cell building um, and not in some new building on the north of campus. But we're here anyway. Let's try to make it nice here. Should we choose a nice background? How do I do that? Let's see. Choose virtual background. Let's go to a nice coffee shop, shall we? Okay, that's so much better. Um, um, fine. So where in, whereas in the succession of men's thought, there is nothing to observe in the things they think on, but either in what they be like one another, or that what they be unlike. So two kinds of people in the world, or what they serve for, or how they serve to such a pur purpose. I don't get that. Or what they serve for, or how they serve to such a purpose. Those that observe their similitudes in case they be such as are but rarely observed by others. Ah, so people, some people observe their similitudes and they see things that are rarely observed by others. They are said to have a good wit, by which in this occasion is meant a good fancy. It's called damning with faint praise. Because what's happening here is they're, well, they're rarely observed. Is that because they're rarely observed because they're not there or they're rarely observed because they're hard to find? The latter would be done, right? But they that observe their differences and dissimilitudes, that's from Milton's uh, uh, Areopagitica as well, but he's using it differently here. But they that observe their differences and dissimilitudes, remember the brotherly dissimilitudes of Areopagitica, in which you just in which you do like done get both the similarity and the and and the difference brotherly dissimilitudes we unpack that it's kind of metaphysical conceit in which is which is contained both difference and similarity um, but here Hobbes is just pushing it in the difference category but they that observe their differences and dissimilitudes which is called distinguishing and discerning and judging between thing and thing in case such discerning be not easy, I are said to have a good judgment. And particularly in matter of conversation and business, where in time, places and persons are to be discerned, this virtue is called discretion. The former that is fancy without the help of judgment is not, note, is not commended as a virtue. There you go, right? But the latter, which is judgment and discretion, is commended for itself without the help of fancy. So enter judgment, exit fancy. Enter judgment, enter the imagination. This is where Estelle is coming from. Besides the discretion of times, places, and persons necessary to a good fancy, there is required also an application of his thoughts to their end. That is to say, to some use to be made of them. This done, he that hath this virtue will be easily fitted with similitudes that will please not only illustrations of his discourse and adorning it with new and apt metaphors, but also by the rarity of their invention. Note what he's putting here, right? Similitudes, metaphors, adornment, um, and also invention. They're, in, they're, they're merely invented, not as we might say of done, discovered, that's how he would look at it, but invented. But without steadiness and direction to some end, a great fancy is one kind of madness, such as they have that entering into any discourse are snatched for their purpose by everything that comes in their thought. You know anybody like this, free associates all the time? Into so many and so long digressions and parentheses that they utterly lose themselves which kind of folly I know particular name for. Wow. Um, you see, it's a pretty damning. You see, this is what poetry now has to, and this is what Dr. Shapiro was teaching you. How do you write poetry after this? How do you write poetry for a culture of judgment and not the wit about which Dunn writes? I guess maybe wit will get redefined. Um, but uh, Hobbes and here Locke will raise the stakes of, of what it means, of how difficult it will be to write poetry or a poetry of discovery and not mere endowment and invention. Here's Locke. He's obviously read Hobbes and hence perhaps may be given some reason of that common observation that men who have a great deal of wit and prompt memories 
have not always the clearest judgment or deepest reason. Freud and, uh, Freud and Locke walk into a bar. What do they talk about? Not very much. That men who have a great deal of wit and prompt memories have not always the clearest judgment or deepest reason. For you see, right, the, the Locke is rejecting the man of wit, the man of fancy, the man of free association. I'm, I'm projecting that onto Locke, those prompting memories. For wit lying mostly, and we're not even, I don't, is there fancy here or just wit? For wit lying most in the assemblage of ideas and putting those together with quickness and variety, wherein can be found any resemblance or congruity, thereby to make up some pleasant pictures, pleasant adornment and agreeable visions in the fancy. Judgment, on the other hand, on the contrary, lies quite on the other side in separating carefully one from another, ideas where it can be found the least difference, thereby to avoid poets, be, beware of poets, being misled by similitude and by affinity to take one thing for another. So here is Locke warning against poetry and arguing that the true kind of knowledge comes through differentiation. And not only is fancy not um, on that scale, but it is the visions, or not only is wit not on that scale, but wit itself is a detriment to proper understanding. As I said, exit poetry. So this will be the starting point. I mean, I think this is really just interesting to see the way in which we have traveled from Bacon and we put Bacon back in conversation with Dunn through Hobbes and then to Locke. Um, so tracing that concept itself is really interesting. And in a way, in, in seeing the history of wit, you can understand, begin to understand the huge difference in sensibility. Of course, we're speaking very generally now, but the huge difference in sensibility between an 18th century enlightenment perspective and a 17th century poetic perspective. As I think I may have mentioned to some of my other students, and I'll mention it here, um, much of 18th century criticism of 17th century poetry is just a series of misreadings of 17th century poetry according to the assumptions and presuppositions of the 18th century. That was a complicated way of me saying what um, Johnson says about Dunn. The, we here or here we see this in in the in the in the encounter of Johnson with Dunn. We see the encounter of the 18th century sensibility of distinction and differentiation with the 17th century's uh, uh, um, sensibility of both differentiation and similarity. And that 18th century perspective struggles with great difficulty with that perspective. I think Johnson, as I said to you is a sympathetic reader of Dunn, even despite himself. Um, remember that passage he says here, wit may be more rigorously and philosophically considered a kind of discordia concourse, a combination of dissimilar images, or here is where in one, in one phrase, in one part of a sentence, Johnson is showing a, a great, a, an understanding of Dunn, which is really useful, or, Discovery again. This is how this is how Don himself would look at it. Or discovery of occult resemblances in things apparently unlike. That is a great definition of metaphysical poetry. Yet the rest of the, all of the argument of Johnson and everything we'll see emanating from Hobbes and Locke is that poets bring things together that don't belong together. There's our history of wit. We will. I will. I will um, provide some readings from a serious proposal and we will look at some passages from some reflections on marriage to see where as where and how estelle fits into this story Yalla.